All right. Hello, everyone. I am going to be talking to you about uh, Bayesian optimization and will sort of run the gamut uh, over Bayesian optimization. I'll talk about some of the um, some, some sort of basics and then get into some more extensions and things like that. And what I'm hoping is that this is going to be a sort of lightning whirlwind tour of Bayesian optimization. Um, I'm going to go over as much uh, that I can. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to pick up uh, any paper on Bayesian optimization and be able to read it, understand it, know what's going on uh, with no problem. So I've set myself up for success there. Um, okay. Okay. Oh, just decided it wanted to not listen to me for a while. So, okay. So the outline of what I'm going to do is first I'm going to give sort of a brief introduction of the problem we're trying to solve, the sort of black box optimization problem we're interested in solving. Um, and then the next two sections are going to be dealing with sort of the uh, meat of Bayesian optimization. So building a model of the objective function that we're uh, uh, interested in optimizing. And then given that model, how are we going to explore in, uh, in the input space of the function we're trying to optimize? I'll then get to some extensions of Bayesian optimization, some sort of interesting things we can uh, add on top of this sort of you know, meaty structure. Um, and then we'll get to some interesting applications. And if time permits, there's a, a little light bit of theory to, uh, to sort of end out the tutorial. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, so introduction. OK. Okay, so black box optimization. The problem that we're interested in solving is we have some function f, but we don't have direct access to f. So we, we can't take gradients of f. All we know is that um, I can query f at some input location x, and I'm going to get back some noisy uh, estimate of the actual value. So there's some late, true latent value. I'm interested in optimizing that true latent value, but I never have access to that true latent value. So it's a black box because uh, I don't have any gradients of it. Of course, there are extensions that I won't actually talk about today, but there are ways to incorporate gradient information into this sort of uh, black box Bayesian optimization setting. Um, but in general, I'm going to assume that uh, there are no gradients. Um, typically, my evaluations, each time I query the function, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be quite costly, um, and that our observations may be corrupted by noise. OK, so the optimization process involves designing a sequential strategy to query this function. OK, so some examples of this, and I'll get to some more detailed and, and perhaps um, some more interesting examples of this. But some very classic examples are the setting of A-B testing. So I might have some different configurations of, say, a website or some product that I'm interested in, and I want to determine the best configurations. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to design two different experiments, call them A and B, hence the name, um, and I'm going to uh, give these to users to try and learn about the model in order to optimize, say if I'm a website, I might want to optimize the click rate. I might, might want, want to optimize some measure of my revenue, et cetera. Also, as uh, uh, machine learning practitioners, often we might have some big complicated algorithm which has a number of different hyperparameters. Um, and those hyperparameters may themselves be hard to tune. So what we want to do is uh, optimize with respect to see these maybe on some uh, test set. OK, but really, at the end of the day, this is any optimization problem that I might be interested in solving. So, so long as I have black box access to the function, I can throw this at any of these functions. OK, so I'm going to start out with a sort of cartoon picture of model-based black box optimization. 
So here, what I'm showing to you right now is a function that I might be interested in solving. So this little dashed line here is the true latent f um, that I'm interested in finding the maximization of. So again, I, I should stress the fact that um, us in the sort of uh, uh, Bayesian optimization world were very optimistic people. And so we generally, generally maximize our functions rather than minimize them. So we should get that out of the way first. But OK, so I'm interested in optimizing and maximizing, <laughs> maximizing this function. Um, so this is the true function. But one thing I like to do is start out by looking at what sort of the optimizer actually sees. And so I might take some initial sample of 10 some odd points, and this is all I get to see. Um, but of course, dealing with this directly uh, uh, is somewhat difficult. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a model of what this, uh, the latent function might actually look like. So now I've sort of taken some initial points. I've created a model of the function that I'm interested in optimizing. Again, I don't have direct access to the function itself. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct, I'm going to use some acquisition function. This acquisition function is, is really the thing at the heart of Bayesian optimization. And I'll give a number of sort of classical and more modern examples of these acquisition functions later in the talk. But what this is really doing is saying, what are the points that I should evaluate next? So here we can see that there is, um, there is one point here, this, this sort of uh, curve, this point right here, that is the highest. So what I'm going to do is maximize the, uh, uh, the acquisition function. And maximizing this acquisition function is going to tell me uh, what point I should evaluate next. So this is how I'm designing my policy for this optimization process. And then the rest of the sort of optimization loop follows quite naturally from this. So now that we've found the next point, we're going to evaluate it. Um, we're going to get a new point, um, a, a new observation, and we're going to update our model. And then we're going to repeat this process ad infinitum. Um, uh, until we reach some convergence criteria, or the amount of time that I've been given just elapses. Um, and then I'm going to make some recommendation. So the recommendation, which I will mostly not talk about uh, uh, during this talk, but uh, it is sort of a crucial part of this algorithm. It's really the thing that once I get to the end of optimization, it is what I should give to the user to say, this is your best point. And usually in sort of local optimization uh, uh, settings, um, this is easy to do. This is just whatever the last point you evaluated. But here, since we're building this model, we might actually try points to try and gain information that are not necessarily good points. They'll get us a lot of information, but I don't necessarily think that they're going to be the best point. So we have this additional step here, which is determining what our recommendation is, which in the setting of Bayesian optimization is often going to be a maximization over my learned latent function. So I'm going to learn my model and then maximize that to give a final, a final recommendation. OK, so now we've, we've seen this cartoon picture of black box optimization. Notice, of course, that uh, in, in what I've led up to, up to this point, I haven't really said the word Bayesian. So there's an entire class of, of uh, models and problems uh, that I will touch upon briefly at the uh, end of this talk, which use sort of non-Bayesian approaches to uh, build uh, this sort of model. So if we consider a function which is only defined over finite indices, so I really have only point mass evaluations that say points one through five, and I might be able to say that my, my noisy observation process, rather than being Gaussian, uh, is Bernoulli. So I observe a 0 or 1 with probability given by the height of those lines right there. Well, this is sort of a, a classic bandit problem. A classic bandit problem sort of first introduced maybe around 1933. But if we look at the uh, bandits literature up to about the 70s, uh, it was trying exactly problems like this. So this is the same sort of problem that I'm interested in solving in Bayesian optimization, this sort of bandit problem, where I can query points and get back a noisy observation. However, there's also this tendency to lump these things together with what, what I would say are bandit algorithms, 
which make use of frequentist bounds over my model to, uh, of the unknown function and use these sort of frequentist bounds to uh, derive their own sort of novel acquisition strategies. So, um, and there's actually quite a bit of interplay, especially if you go about trying to prove, say, regret bounds about these algorithms. Um, and they, they end up, the more you look into it, they end up looking very, very similar. But that being said, I am going to focus on this talk in building Bayesian models of the underlying function that I'm trying to optimize. OK. So again, um, in the spirit of connecting with other areas of research, um, Another area that is quite closely related is the sort of more general problem, I would say, of reinforcement learning. So Bayesian optimization, like a bandit problem, is in some sense a simplified reinforcement learning problem. So uh, essentially, there is no state. Or if there is a state, there could be some context. If we think about this in the, the setting of, say, A-B testing for optimizing click-through rates of a, uh, of a website, there might be some additional context I know about the user. But in some sense, I can't control the user. I can't tell the user, OK, you're going to like red things today. I can't do that. So I have no direct control over the state. The state just comes in to me. I get to observe it. And maybe that will modify um, what my next action to take is. However, the, the one sort of central thing in both reinforcement learning and uh, bandit-based approaches and Bayesian optimization is this sort of exploration exploitation trade-off. So what this really means is that I have a trade-off when I'm deciding to take a new action, deciding to query a point in my function. I have a trade-off between improving on a point that I already think is good. So perhaps I would only do a small, I would only move a small epsilon away from my previously best point. Um, or I can evaluate entirely new points in underexplored areas. So the first point is really the, the sort of idea of exploitation. I want to exploit the current set of knowledge that I have. And the second point is whether I do exploration, whether I go to entirely underserved areas of, of my function landscape. So and there's this, this trade-off between how I want to go about this in order to gain the most information as I can about not only the function, but about the maximum of the function. So another key difference with sort of uh, some parts of RL, and especially bandits, is that often in Bayesian optimization, it's in the name, we're interested in optimization. Um, we're interested in only the value of the point that I get and I give to the, uh, the user, the point that I recommend at the final step. So in the bandits literature, this is often referred to as a pure exploration or simple regret minimization problem, as opposed to the sort of more commonly um, used sort of uh, analysis mechanism, which is the cumulative regret. Whereas uh, in that setting, I would be judged by all of the function values that uh, I, I tried along the way. So the difference between this is really that in sort of the cumulative setting, I might say um, I would stick my hand on a, a hot burner. I would decide, ow, that really hurt. I'm never going to try that again. Whereas the sort of more explorative uh, method would say, well, OK, I tried that once, but maybe I should do it again just to make sure. So you're sort of able to get more information when uh, you are able to go back to points that you think might be bad, but you really want to confirm that they're bad. Um, and we'll come back to this. You can see some of this in the analysis that I'll show later. OK, so uh, to give a high level overview, um, we can also look at sort of the axes of black box optimization. And really, I, I, I sort of describe these sort of algorithms on uh, sort of three axes here. We have sort of the performance metric that we're interested in looking at, whether we're looking at things offline or online in the uh, uh, cumulative or simple regret setting, the modeling technique, which is the uh, uh, x-axis here, whether I'm using Bayesian or frequentist models, and then sort of the z-axis, which is how my different points that I might evaluate interact, whether they are independent, where looking at one point gives me no information about other points, or whether they're correlated in some way. 
And typically, we can see that sort of classically, Bayesian optimization is on uh, one corner of uh, this, uh, this sort of cube here. And sort of the bandits literature is on the other corner of this cube. Now, that's a bit of a gross simplification. And, and definitely over the years, these two sets of literatures has, have interacted much more. And we can see that uh, there, I'm not going to go over all of these. And, well, actually, some of these techniques I'll, I'll go over in a little bit. But most of the areas of this cube have sort of been filled out uh, over the years. Um, and some of them are mainly related to analysis. Some of these points of the cube are actually developing strange and wonderful new algorithms some of which I will talk about. But OK, now that we've sort of taken a look at sort of a high level overview of uh, Bayesian optimization and how it sort of interacts with bandits, um, we can ask two primary questions. And those two primary questions are, first, what is the model that I'm going to use? What is the, the mechanism by which I'm going to model my latent function? And then given that model, what is the exploration strategy that I'm going to use to query novel points uh, within the input space? OK, so first step, let's talk about modeling. So the simplest answer, and this is pretty much the answer you would get if you did a cursory glance of the Bayesian optimization literature, is to use a Gaussian process. Um, and maybe this sort of answer, uh, well, I don't even think maybe. This is probably too glib of an answer. Um, the literature, I think, probably focuses too much on, uh, on Gaussian processes, which, in fact, by the way, I am going to do for pretty much the rest of this talk, because I am also part of the problem. Um, but uh, the nice thing about Gaussian processes is they give a really nice mechanism for modeling nice continuous functions, which are what we're often looking at. Um, and they're very general, and the math is very pretty. Um, and, and so we generally sort of stick to these things. But we have the whole world of, uh, of models available to us. And maybe particular models are better in particular settings. Um, so what are the things that we might actually need to do to perform Bayesian optimization? Well, we want a model M that can both make predictions and maintain some level of uncertainty over those predictions. And when I say predictions, I generally mean predictions about the latent function f. Um, so it's useful to be able to make predictions about my outcomes, my, my outcomes y. But generally, the thing that I'm interested in optimizing is that latent function f. So that is the primary thing I need to model and the primary thing that I need to be able to reason about. So um, one thing we can do is assume that the, the first and uh, uh, most obvious easy thing that we need is we need to be able to make observations, record those observations, and somehow update our model. And then we need to be able to make predictions about our, uh, the posterior over our latent function f. Um, then there are a couple of things that, depending on the different sort of uh, uh, acquisition functions that you use, you may need to perform different sort of uh, uh, different sort of uh, actions on your model. You might need to be able to sample from your model, so sample latent functions f. You might need to be able to get the probability that your latent function f at a given point x exceeds some value v. Um, you might have to take the integral of this probability that you're uh, above v. Um, you might want to be able to uh, evaluate quantile quantiles of your latent function f. Or you might want to uh, evaluate the entropy of your predictions at some particular point x. And these are all generally going to be uh, 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 dependent on the data that we've seen so far. So the reason why I, I put these up here, there's, there's generally some overlap between a lot of these uh, different functions we might want to evaluate on our model. But whether you can 
whether you can perform these different uh, procedures sort of tells you what sort of approaches and what sort of acquisition functions you can make use of uh, within your, uh, uh, with, within this particular model class. So the first two, the make observations and make predictions are sort of universal. Uh, if you can't make observations and make predictions, you probably can't do Bayesian optimization. So you need to, uh, uh, you need to be able to do those. But as soon as you can even just sample from your model, uh, you can perform Thompson sampling. So, uh, and and I'll, I'll introduce all of these in the next couple of slides. But one of the great things about Thompson sampling is that it's perhaps one of the easiest of these methods to implement. Um, now, if you can get the tail probabilities, you can, uh, as probably evidenced by its name, you can perform probability of improvement, so PI. If you can get improvement, you can get the uh, expected improvement. And with the quantiles, um, you can generally implement pretty much any form of an upper confidence bound or UCB type algorithm. And as soon as you can get the entropy, you can uh, uh, make use of the uh, uh, entropy search or predictive entropy search methods. Yeah? Ah. OK, so uh, we'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But very short, so the, the question, by the way, was the difference between predict and sample. So uh, as soon as you can make predictions, you can probably uh, uh, sample from the function. But what I'm really saying is that uh, at some point y, or at some point x, excuse me, you can get the most likely, the expected prediction. So the expected f of x uh, at uh, uh, at that particular point. And sample is a little bit more. That means you, you not only can you make predictions about the expected value, you can sample from the posterior distribution at that particular point. Yeah? OK, yes. If you can sample, you can do pretty much everything else. You might not, so you might not want to restrict yourself to only sampling. And in some instances, there can be more efficient mechanisms for computing some of these things. But, but yes, you're absolutely right. OK. OK, okay so that being said, um, again, I'm, I'm part of the problem. Uh, uh, we're, uh, I'm going to restrict myself to using Gaussian processes for pretty much the rest of this talk. And uh, if you look at anything in the Bayesian optimization literature, you had probably better understand uh, Gaussian processes because 90% of the literature actually is restricted to Gaussian processes. It need not be, but that's just the way the world works. Um, OK, so generally, uh, what is nice about Gaussian processes? They provide us a flexible model of continuous functions that we're generally going to work with when we're uh, performing Bayesian optimization. Uh, although you can also restrict them to, say, a, a finite set of points. And then it's even easier, because then you just have a single multivariate Gaussian distribution. OK, so what it looks like when we're looking at functions, this is uh, using a, a simple squared exponential kernel here that just controls sort of the smoothness of the function. I'm going to give just a very, very brief overview of Gaussian processes. Um, but what ends up happening is you end up with something that looks like a prior over functions. And what I've shown here in the, the sort of dark blue line on the left is my mean, the mean of my prior, and the bands are giving the uh, standard error uh, of this prior. And then what I've done is I've drawn three different samples from this Gaussian process prior. So this particular form of prior gets me sort of nice, smoothly varying uh, functions. But now what I can do is I can condition on some functions evaluations shown on the uh, other side here on the right um, with these sort of dark crosses. And what we see is that those uh, uh, evaluations constrain my model to be within uh, uh, some region of where we actually made those observations. And there's also a noise model, which is, in, in the, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that our observation model is Gaussian, which can sort of control 
how much you clamp down the variance once you've observed a point. But again, many of these models can be replaced. This is just sort of the simplest way to start with. OK, so the basics of Gaussian processes is that we have a finite, if we have any finite collection of input points x, I can talk about the diff distribution of my function evaluated at those input points x, and that using a zero mean Gaussian process, so that's where the zero comes from here, um, that is going to be just a simple multivariate Gaussian distribution. OK, so we have a nice, simple uh, Gaussian distribution where the covariance between any two points is given by this kernel function k. OK, so if we do that, again, I, I said that uh, I can, uh, any finite collection of input points I, is going to be given by a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So what I can now consider is uh, I have a set of noisy observations that, that came from my function. I'm going to collect this into some vector y. And then we can form the joint distribution between uh, my function f at some arbitrary new point x and the set of variables that I observed y. OK, well, for that new point x, we can then condition only on the observations y. And doing a little bit of linear algebra, we get a new Gaussian process, our posterior Gaussian process, which has a mean given by that, that first equation there and a variance given by that second equation there. So again, this is just a, a little bit of, of linear algebra. You can find a good overview of this in um, uh, Carl Rasmussen's book on Gaussian processes. However, the main key point to observe, and we'll come back to this when we talk about some of the extensions of Bayesian optimization, is that the main difficulty here is that matrix inversion right there. So that is what's going to be expensive when we do Bayesian optimization with Gaussian processes. Uh, now, in the setting where my function evaluations are really quite expensive, like maybe I have to go out into the real world and perform some chemistry experiment in order to get back observations, and that's going to take on the orders of 10 minutes to 30 minutes to hours to days, this little matrix uh, uh, inversion here is not going to make a difference. But once we start playing with the, uh, the cost of my function evaluations. Once my function evaluations get uh, less costly to perform, that's one of the instances where I am going to want to seriously consider replacing this with some sort of lighter model. OK, so now that I've uh, assumed that I'm using a Gaussian process, let's talk about some of the exploration strategies that uh, I can use. Hopefully that goes away. OK. So some of the exploration strategies I can use that are dependent on my model. And so the first thing I'm going to point out is that I'll first give these, uh, uh, different, uh, these different strategies independent of the particular model, and then I'll simplify them for uh, a Gaussian process. Um, OK. So the first thing to point out, however, before I, I, I give a few examples, is that what I really want is an exploration strategy, which is a policy which maps from my model, perhaps my model and my data, if it's some, uh, it may be uh, uh, nicer to think of these as two separate entities. Um, but so I, given my model and given all of the data I've seen so far, I want to get a query point, the next point I'm going to evaluate. Now, uh, as I've already stated, we are going to uh, uh, put off sort of what this actually looks like to the type of acquisition function we're going to use. So this sort of policy for querying my model depends only on the acquisition function. And in this acquisition function, it does depend on the model and the data, but I'm pretty much for the rest of this talk going to just drop that and I'll write it as just some acquisition function alpha of x. That's the thing that I want to optimize. One point to, to sort of make sure is clear here is that this is also very much related to the distinction between value functions and policies uh, in uh, reinforcement learning. So in some sense, the alpha, the acquisition function, is my value function. Or, and in fact, 
there is a way to sort of, and that I'll, I'll describe in, I believe, the next slide, to give the optimal value for this value function under certain ex, uh, uh, circumstances. I could actually compute the optimal value function, and then I have the optimal policy. As you might guess, there's a reason why this field exists, because that optimal value is way too expensive to compute in practice. But the idea is that most of the acquisition functions we introduce are going to be very much related to this idea of the future value of a point. OK. So I said earlier that, that uh, this is sort of an RL problem with no state. That's actually not quite true. Um, if we look at things in the online setting, um, it's actually a partially observable MDP. And so if you want to think about it as an MDP, for those of you who are uh, well-versed in reinforcement learning, um, there actually is a state. It's sort of the information state. You can think about this as a state describing what my distribution is over the possible values. So we could actually formulate it in this way. Um, the, uh, the state transition model that I have for this Markov decision process ends up being the straight state transition model that you get from performing the Bayesian updates. Um, and then you could solve this. However, the problem is that solving this control problem is quite intractable in general. In the best case, when I only have a finite number of, uh, uh, finite number of points to evaluate, I only want to evaluate my function at some uh, set of uh, discrete finite points, then the best case complexity for computing this optimal policy is the time horizon multiplied by the number of states squared. Um, this also, I say this is in the best case because this also assumes that the evaluations are independent. Once you break any of these tenets, the uh, complexity of computing this optimal policy skyrockets. So instead, what we're going to do is use heuristics that are hopefully close to optimal. So um, this optimal strategy with, uh, uh, independent, um, uh, with independent points is actually known as the, uh, the Gittins indices. Um, and this is exactly can be formulated as solving this sort of uh, implicit Palm DP um, in the setting where you have uh, independent uh, points that you're evaluating. Um, so what I've shown here is just a plot of the cumulative regret. So the cumulative distance I have from the optimum for a number of different strategies. So the interesting thing to point out here is that these are all somewhat logarithmic in the time horizon. Um, I've sort of hidden a few things here, because as you see on the x-axis, I go up to 10,000 iterations. And if I have really expensive function evaluations, 10,000 iterations is probably more than I'm going to be able to evaluate. So in fact, on the very, very left-hand side of, uh, of this plot, this is where some of the interesting things happen, because some of these algorithms can flip around on the very left-hand side of this plot, which you can't really see here. But the interesting thing to point out is that the, there are two algorithms that are on the bottom here. One is this Bayes UCBQ, which uses quantiles. And the other, in purple, is the Gittins indices. And they pretty much overlap exactly, which is great. This means asymptotically, you can uh, avoid the, uh, uh, the computation required for Gittins indices and use something like Bayes UCBQ, and you get, can get pretty close to the optimal behavior. And if you actually look closely, I'm not sure if everyone can see this here, but these, there's a blue curve, which is the Bayes UCB, and the sort of magenta curve, which is Gittins. Um, Gittins only goes up to about 1,000 iterations. And it only goes up to about 1,000 iterations because um, I think this plot is a few years old, and uh, I didn't actually, it took at least half a day to uh, run this strategy. Um, so it does continue at about this rate, but it just takes way too long. Um, OK. So uh, yeah, 
Uh, so what I'm actually doing here between these two plots, um, the that one makes uh, so that per, these are three different uh, uh, implementations of UCB. That one um, makes a few different assumptions, um, and as we skyrocket the number of um, arms, that one just has more variance. Um, and so if I use many more samples, that, that would smooth out. But the variance goes up, and here I'm not plotting the variance, but the variance of this method sort of goes up as you add more arms. As you add more arms, and, and where arms are uh, uh, generally what we refer to as these sort of finite locations that we're going to evaluate at. Okay. Okay. So one last sort of uh, high-level intuition on exploration versus exploitation. So intuitively, all of the methods that I'm going to describe are trying to greedily gain information uh, about the maximum. Um, by giving an exploration bonus to underexplored regions. So in fact, this, this ties quite nicely with the tutorial we heard uh, just a moment ago, um, which was talking about learning about the function f. So there, you're trying to gain information about what the function f is doing. Whereas in, in the uh, setting of Bayesian optimization, bandits, et cetera, we don't really care about learning about the function. The only reason we care about learning about the function is in how much it helps us to find the optimum. Um, so uh, we design these acquisition strategies, and they are going to be myopic with respect to these acquisition strategies. But again, as I pointed out in the last slide, uh, these acquisition strategies are attempting to be close to the sort of optimal value function. So, and the optimal value function already contains all of the information you need in order to explore. So, just to point out where these, uh, uh, where these differences lie, so one thing I could do if I wanted to be sort of purely explorative is I could just pay attention to the variance in my model. I could just try and optimize for the point that is the expected to uh, reduce my variance in the quickest way. So in a Gaussian process with a, a squared exponential kernel that I've just talked about, this is going to end up being this point that I've labeled right here, which uh, is the point with the highest variance. Um, but if I wanted to be purely exploitative, I might just stick to the point, the point on the far right-hand side, which is the best thing that I've seen so far. I could be slightly less exploitative in moving just a small distance away. But the thing to point out is that I can also take a look at what the value of this sort of exploitative action would be and look at all of the mass that exists for my function above this cutoff point. Um, and sort of the various mechanisms I'm going to introduce are trying to really look at different ways of evaluating how much either probability mass or how much value there is above this line right here. Um, and so one thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce this um, sort of F star, which is the value of my incumbent, which is just the best thing I've seen so far. Um, generally, this is going to be sort of the expected value of the best thing because my model will generally have noise. Okay, so now we're going to introduce these acquisition functions, and there, I'm not really, I'm not going to show you sort of plots like I showed you in the previous slide of how these methods compare because I, I think that at least at this level, that is too dependent on the particular model we're interested in. Uh, optimizing, and everyone here is probably going to have different models they're interested in optimizing, um, and the time horizon you're interested in optimizing, uh, things like that. So all of these models that I'm going to introduce, I mean, so certainly there are bad models um, that, that you could use. Um, it's somewhat difficult to come up with bad models, especially when something like random search actually doesn't perform that badly. Um, the models I will, or the mechanisms I will talk about right now are generally better than random search. Uh, 
but they have their sort of different uses. And I'll, I'll sort of describe what those are. Um, and they sometimes make different assumptions, and some of them you may want to prove something about them, and it can be easier or harder in different, uh, it, with different acquisition functions. Okay, so the first one, um, which is historically probably the uh, uh, second acquisition function that was really used widely, although the first one wasn't really rediscovered until 2000 something. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about is the probability of improvement. So this is just really saying, given my latent function f, given that random variable, which with a Gaussian process is going to be just a Gaussian, what is the probability that it exceeds the value of my incumbent, given the data that I've seen so far? So with a Gaussian process, this can be evaluated very, very simply. This is just the standal, eh, standard normal CDF. The standard normal CDF evaluated at this shifted and rescaled sort of standardized Gaussian. So we're really just saying, what is the uh, CDF to say that we improve over the incumbent value f? So, and this is going to be our acquisition function. This alpha of x, this is our first acquisition function. Now, if you decide to leave the talk, you can go implement at least some uh, Bayesian optimization mechanism, and it will probably work reasonably well. Um, OK, so what this is actually doing pictorially, here the horizontal line that I've drawn here uh, is the latent value at the uh, at x star. This, this thing on the right, this is f of x star is f star. Um, and so just integrated the probability of mass of being above this value. OK? So this is just saying, again, what is the probability at any uh, point that I'm going to be above this value? So we see that there are really, in this particular drawing here, there are really just two regions where this is um, uh, not a very, very small value. This is going to be the sort of areas on the right hand and the left hand side. So everything that where most of the mass is sort of below this line, we're pretty much discounting. We're sort of carving out uh, areas of the space. So we can actually see this happening in practice. Um, here, I'm, I'm going to show this for a few of the acquisition functions, just to give you sort of an intuitive feel for what some of these uh, methods do. Um, this is PI in practice. Here I've sampled an initial point at 1.5, um, and then I'm going to let it run for just a few iterations. So the red bar here is the next query point that I'm going to evaluate. So I'll evaluate at that red bar. Yeah? Oh, sure. Uh, where? Yeah, so here we're actually looking at two different noise terms here. The sigma on the bottom is also a yeah, so, so this, is the, this is the posterior, uh, well, the posterior standard deviation. So this is crucially, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is just saying, this is just, um, we're really just taking the integral that I have on this next slide. So this is just a way to put it in, in a nice form, and the sigma there is going to be the posterior standard deviation which is going to be, it's going to involve sort of the, the sigma of the actual noise of the system. But crucially, um, if you wanted to get the posterior uh, variance over f, that will be this term right here. If you wanted to get the posterior variance over y, you would have an additional term of, of sort of the noise sigma, the noise variance that you would have for going from f to y. Um, so no. So often what you will do is um, all of what I, so we'll get, get around to this at the end, but often what we're going to do is we're actually going to put some sort of hyper priors over these values and we're going to do some sort of inference to, usually it's going to be MCMC or SMC, but variational methods could be used at will. Uh, no, 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 because that is, so that is captured, so in computing these bands right here, that is captured already. 
So here I'm showing basically the same thing as the last couple of slides, and we're just going to step through a few steps of this happening. Um, and we're going to evaluate at the red bar at, I think it's at 0 0.8, somewhere around there. So we're going to evaluate there. Uh, and here I've stepped ahead like five steps. And we see that um, we've, we've shrank down our variance and moved our mean at a couple of different points. And so we can step along for a few steps. And what you see is that generally uh, the probability of improvement metric here is going to give you this very sort of difficult to uh, optimize procedure. Every time that you make an evaluation, you're essentially splitting your state space up into another couple of local modes. So uh, here we've basically converged. But in higher dimensions, this quantity can be somewhat difficult to optimize. Many of these uh, uh, quantities that I'm going to introduce can be hard to optimize. However, PI is probably one of the more difficult ones. Um, now, what is a problem with it? Well, we're really looking at the probability of improvement. So with the probability of improvement, um, there's a uh, chance that high candidates Candidates with, uh, where the acquisition are high are very likely to be very close to the current incumbent. Because what are points that are most likely to improve? Well, there are co points that are probably very close to whatever my current best point is. So what that really means is that this uh, acquisition function can often be very greedy. Now, maybe sometimes. Uh, and, and this is why uh, I'm, I'm not going to sort of show plots comparing, sort of pitting all of these different acquisition functions. Uh, this is often said as a bad thing. But if you're, let's say you're optimizing a, uh, a convex function um, where you don't want to be jumping all over the space, being greedy can actually be pretty good. Um, so uh, PI in, in sort of simple unimodal settings can often be sort of the best performer. Once you get multiple modes, it, its performance can often pretty much tank. And that is often because of the fact that it is being much too greedy. And it really focuses on one mode to the exclusion of all of other modes. OK, so one way and one simple way to correct this behavior of PI is rather than just looking at the probability that we improve, let's take the expectation of the value of f with respect to this distribution that I showed in the previous plot. So this is the expected improvement acquisition function. It's often um, in uh, other literatures known as sort of efficient global optimization, um, which is a great name. I just think it's probably a little bit too broad. Um, but uh, this is sort of one of the most widely used acquisition functions in Bayesian optimization. Um, and that's because it's sort of simple to implement, and it also does relatively well. Um, and it has sort of existed since probably about 1978, but was really popularized by Jones in 1998, which is a fantastic paper if you're uh, interested in this literature. Um, OK, so what this is really saying is we're going to take the uh, integral with respect to the previous distribution I showed. And again, in the Gaussian process setting, where everything is normal, this ends up being a very simple uh, thing to compute. Um, so this ends up being the CDF um, multiple, or, uh, added together with a variance term times the PDF of the Gaussian. Um, which you can work out if you just uh, work through this integral. And so it's relatively easy to get to work. And because it's taking a look at the, uh, the actual value, it tends to be less myopic than uh, probability of improvement. Um, and again, this is sort of the workhorse of uh, Bayesian optimization in practice. Um, so if you see someone saying that they're using Bayesian optimization and they don't really say what they're doing, they're probably doing expected improvement. Okay. So in practice, we can sort of go through a, a similar scheme as before and see what this looks like. Um, and I'll step through a few steps here. And what we see is you get a function that's a little bit easier to optimize, um, but it also, as we get closer and closer to the optimum, it pretty much just plateaus out. Um, and you've probably looked at most of the space 
and nothing is really all that distinguishable. So this can also become, yeah? Um, oh, yes, yes. Uh, so here, often what we, uh, uh, what we do is we specify uh, a, 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 a hypercube around where we're actually trying to optimize. Um, because generally, so this is not necessary, but when we're using a Gaussian process, often what's going to happen is we're going to use very sort of local kernels. Um, and so we'll say that around the points that I've evaluated, uh, things, are, uh, things look quite good. Um, and we're, we're reducing the variance quite a bit. So we've pretty much converged at this point, once we get to this point. But if you look outside of these bounds that I've showed you right here, the variance will skyrocket back up. And because you don't know anything about those spaces, so if you were to take most of these acquisition functions or just really think about it logically, you really should be moving outside of the space if there are no constraints. Um, so there is actually some work by um, Bobak uh, Shahari um, who has worked on attacking this problem by basically starting with a, a sort of small hypercube and slowly growing it over time. So you're, you're less constrained to really know what a good hypercube is to begin with. Um, so OK, this is uh, ex the expected improvement metric. Again, uh, sort of the most widely used. Um, I would say one of the second most popular uh, uh, methods is probably the GPUCB method in Bayesian optimization. But also, this really comes from uh, the bandit literature. So uh, the, the, this work right here is really a combination of the sort of traditional Bayesian optimization ideas with more uh, sort of uh, standard methods in, uh, in bandits optimization, but now applied to these sort of continuous spaces that we're working with. So generally, the uh, idea behind uh, upper confidence bound techniques is that we want some sort of high probability uh, upper bound on the value of the true function f. OK, so this is going to be uh, alpha of x equal to some q. So it's going to be some sort of quantile-like function uh, where the probability that our function is less than q is given by some 1 minus delta, which can be a little bit difficult to work with. But again, uh, was there a question? Yeah. Uh, what? Ah, so generally, there, there are a number of mechanisms used uh, in practice. One, you can uh, pretty much for all of these functions, you can compute the gradients, and you can uh, do sort of a multi-start gradient descent procedure. Uh, again, uh, this, is, um, this is not stochastic gradient descent, so we can, uh, you know, we can actually do line search and things like that. Or there are a number of methods that uh, were used for a number of years, but have probably sort of fallen out of favor nowadays, um, which are based on sort of divided rectangles, more sort of classical uh, global optimization work, um, uh, which sort of is based on sort of evaluating and updating a, a sort of Lipschitz-like constant for the function you're trying to optimize. Yeah. So, so, so yes, it's definitely true that uh, you, so the, the sort of statements I've said about some of the difficulties of, let's say, optimizing these acquisition functions um, generally holds across different kernel parameters. The also, let's say, the statement about PI being myopic. This has nothing to do with either the Gaussian process or the type of kernel. It's just due to the type of mechanism that uh, probability of improvement is, that it's generally going to only look at points that are uh, very close. As soon as you have 
um, any sort of smoothness assumption. But it is true, and, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, how you get some of these uh, hyperparameters when using Bayesian optimization with uh, Gaussian processes. Um, but uh, most of these, like these, these sort of hold across different sets of hyperparameters, I would say. Yeah. Um, so the, the nice thing about uh, uh, these sort of UCB mechanisms um, is that they hold to this idea of optimism in the face of uncertainty. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll show this when we sort of look at what the acquisition function looks like on the next slide. But really what we're saying is that everything, uh, my, my acquisition is always an upper bound over with high probability what my function could possibly be. And this leads to some sort of nice interpretability of the acquisition function, but it also leads to the ability to prove nice convergence bounds about this particular algorithm, uh, which we, is much more difficult with things like uh, probability of improvement and expected improvement. Although there, there are some uh, actual convergence results for expected improvement. I believe with probability of improvement, you're mostly stuck with it will converge eventually. You have no sort of rates of convergence for probability of improvement. Um, so again, what UCB looks like in practice is you get this sort of result where uh, all of the, uh, the, the acquisition function that we're looking at is generally going to be some sort of multiple of my mean plus the variance. So it's always upper bounding, my, sort of by construction, always upper bounding the, uh, the, function, the function that we're looking at. And so this will sort of shrink down and eventually get to be something like this. So another one that's, that's particularly uh, interesting um, is Thompson sampling. So I'll show how to do this with Gaussian processes in uh, the next slide, uh, but um, this is perhaps one of the uh, methods that is much easier to implement for pretty much everything but a Gaussian process. So really what we want to do is we want to be able to sample a function f from our posterior and then maximize this function f. So if uh, x is just a, a, a uh, evaluated at a finite set of points. Um, this is probably the simplest thing we've introduced so far. All we have to do is sample from our model, which again, if we're only looking at a finite set of points, this is going to be just a simple vector f. Um, and then we just have to take the argmax of it. That's it. Like this is, uh, uh, as soon as you have some sort of model for, uh, uh, for this type of system, uh, then actually doing Thompson sampling uh, with that model is two lines of code. So this is the simplest thing to implement. Again, for Gaussian processes, this is somewhat more difficult because now f is not a finite dimensional thing. f is infinite dimensional. So we can instead approximate this in a number of ways. One particular way is we can approximate it with a random set of Fourier features and then optimize uh, over the input space there. Um, and so this is what this sort of really looks like, is you, uh, take draw you could take multiple draws from the procedure. Thompson sampling actually just says take one draw from the posterior, um, and then the actual histogram for what that thing you're sampling looks like uh, is the uh, thing on the right here. Um, so that will give us the, the sort of x star, sampled x star, in areas where we have a high probability of being optimal. So what this looks like in practice is now, this is just at every iteration, we sample a random function from our posterior and maximize this. So actually, Thompson sampling does uh, a much better job of sort of not getting stuck in sort of local optima. Um, it can be slower in practice, but it jumps around quite a bit, and so it's sort of less likely to get stuck in some sense. Okay, so now I'm going to take a slight diversion into uh, uh, function learning. So let's say 
that I was interested only in learning the function f. I don't, now I, I, I've uh, thrown away everything I've said before, and all I care about is learning the function f and not maximizing the function f. Well, if we wanted to learn the latent function f as quickly as possible, one thing we could do is look at the point x that gives us the highest uh, reduction in entropy of the function f at x. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say Thompson sampling might be, would, would probably be a bit more robust, but all of, all of the methods I've, I've stated so far, all of the methods are pretty much as good as their model. Um, if your model is wrong um, and it is excluding areas, uh, it, so in fact, one thing I would say is, and, and we'll get to this in a bit, if your model is drastically uh, overfitting to the data you've seen so far, none of these methods are going to work. Um, and so uh, this is especially true when we talk about, as was brought up earlier, the hyperparameters of your Gaussian process. Um, this is something that you generally want to make sure that, for example, you do a good job of representing as well uncertainty in the hyperparameters. Because if, for example, the length scale of the squared exponential kernel uh, drops too quickly, um, then you, you will be making completely spurious predictions and you can get premature convergence. So this is something that either you want to sample from these, maintain this posterior over these hyperparameters, or sort of regularize them heavily um, when you initially start optimizing them. No, no, no. The 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 uh, the gamma term in uh, the gamma term is basically in that work is uh, bounded, um, so you don't actually compute it, and that comes from the in in that case comes from the particular uh, choice of the uh, of the kernel. Um, but this, so the information gain that we're going to talk about right here, we're going to approximate it as well, but in a completely different way. So we're, we're so we're again we're going to uh, approximate the information gain here, but as I'll also show in the next slide, we're going to uh, approximate it in a in a fairly different way. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are, so uh, these so so these effects you you definitely see in in high dimensions. Um, we will uh, so we'll we'll get to a, a couple of extensions in a bit. That uh, so in fact high dimensions is not so much the the problem here, but in high dimensions you often you will just very much need to optimize for longer, and so you may need to make more concessions to uh, uh, the computational costs of your model because you know you're going to need to optimize for much longer. Yeah. Um, OK. So, uh, so here, what I'm saying is, so one thing that we can do is we can look at the reduction of, of entropy um, in the uh, Gaussian process that uh, I'm, I'm looking, or the, the model that I'm looking to optimize. OK, so in the, uh, in the GP case, so again, where I'm only interested in fitting my function f, this corresponds exactly to selecting the point with the highest variance. Um, so again, when I'm just trying to learn the function f. So this is really the fully explorative policy noted earlier. But now we can take exactly this same principle and uh, go back to the setting where rather than learning the function f, I'm interested in, in some sense, learning uh, where the maximizer of f is. And so we can express this in exactly the same way, but now my random variable is no longer the function f, but is the location of the maximizer x. And so I can uh, uh, add an additional term, which is just the uh, inherent uh, entropy of that variable 
before I query a new point. And the reason why I've added that in is because now we're just looking at the mutual information between the query point at x and the random variable given by the maximizer x star. OK, so this first, uh, this first quantity is difficult to approximate. But the second really only concerns the predictive distributions of my uh, distribution. And so the first term is called uh, entropy search. The second is predictive entropy search, or PES. Um, and so this is how uh, uh, this is generally, well, this is one way to approximate this acquisition function. So we have these two terms, the entropy of uh, my random variable y and the expectation of uh, the random variable y under the, uh, under the location of x star. So we can approximate this using uh, Monte Carlo. And what we really end up with is, again, we can compute in the Gaussian case the entropy of some random variable y just ends up being the log variance of that Gaussian random variable. And the second, if we can sample points x star and approximate the uh, resulting distribution with a Gaussian, so here we're going to need to approximate, and in general this can be done with some form of EP or some other sort of uh, variational type method. So if we can sample this and we can uh, approximate that second term with a Gaussian, we get something which is just a, a ratio, uh, a log ratio of variances. Well, the first sampling procedure is, that's the Thompson sampling approach that I've already introduced. We just have to sample multiple x stars. And then the second, we is, is just another approximation we will perform using uh, expectation propagation. And so rather than go into more detail about what this looks like, we can really look at what the, um, uh, what the acquisition function needs to compute. So here I've shown for just one simple sample of x star, the blue curve that is sort of in the background is the Gaussian process before conditioning on x star located at the red dashed line, and the green curve is after, uh, pro uh, after this approximation by conditioning on x star. Um, and so what we'll see is when we do this multiple times with multiple samples, uh, this ends up being those regions where we get sort of a minimal reduction in the variance due to conditioning on our sampled x stars. Um, OK, so now. We've sort of gone, run the gamut over a number of different acquisition functions that uh, you will see in the literature. The uh, entropy search one is probably one that's, that's sort of more new and, and, and novel. The rest are, are relatively uh, uh, classical methods, uh, especially PI and EI. But now, what are some additional things that uh, we can do with these methods? Well, first, we've already sort of talked about this uh, in, in a number of different ways. But uh, I have sort of brushed aside the case of hyperparameters for the uh, Gaussian process kernel. But we might be interested in any other model that has additional hyperparameters. And so one thing that uh, was sort of often thought of with Gaussian processes, I, th I think basically this belief has thankfully died out, is that Gaussian processes can't overfit um, because it's a Bayesian method, so they can't overfit. Well, once you start introducing these hyperparameters and, say, uh, performing some sort of type 2 maximum likelihood to optimize these hyperparameters, a Gaussian process can definitely overfit if you have small enough data. And Bayesian optimization, when it starts, will generally have very little data relative to the dimension of the, uh, uh, of the thing that we're trying to fit, of the function space f. So we really should not optimize these hyperparameters. So if, if you think about doing that, well, first ask yourself, should I really be doing this? Um, and then consider that either you should very much, as, as I mentioned earlier, sample these hyperparameters or highly regularize these hyperparameters early on in the optimization procedure so that they don't overfit. In some sense, overfitting of the function f 
is the worst possible thing that can happen for Bayesian optimization. Because most of the methods that we're interested in rely on a great calibrated model would be the best thing that we could hope for. The second best thing we could hope for is something that at least overestimates our uncertainty. If we overestimate our uncertainty, we can still see that there are regions of high uncertainty. We'll get naturally drawn to those regions, and we'll eventually uh, uh, draw the uncertainty down. And that will also lead us to build a better model of our function f. But the worst thing is if we overfit, if we under, uh, underestimate the, uh, the uncertainty either in certain regions or everywhere, that's generally going to cause us to prematurely converge to a point. And then since Bayesian optimization is based primarily on using the uncertainty to direct its optimization, we'll never go anywhere again. So the, the entire procedure can, can fail if we do this. So again, um, this is sort of a, sm a somewhat small point, but it's definitely one that's not to be overlooked. We, mu we must sample these things and make sure that we don't underestimate our uncertainty. OK. So this was another point that was uh, brought up. Um, in, in the case of high dimensional data, um, you may need to run uh, uh, long trajectories, long sets of queries through our model. Um, and even if we don't have high dimensional data, but perhaps it's very noisy, perhaps our data is very noisy and we need to let our optimiz optimization run for a large number of steps, um, the cost of inverting the matrix um, in a Gaussian process can then start to hit us. Um, so classical approaches around this include using sparse Gaussian processes and other uh, uh, such approximations. Another s sort of strong contender, um, and Frank Hutter um, has been doing a lot of great work here, uh, is to, uh, and has for a while, is to use random forests to, uh, to fit these models. Um, However, again, and this ties with the, the same sort of point I made about hyperparameters, care must be taken that the uncertainty estimates are sort of accurate away from the data. Um, so here what I've shown on the bottom, and this comes from work from uh, 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 a, a sort of review paper from Bobak Shahari and, and others. Um, here we show the uh, exact Gaussian process, a sparse Gaussian process approximation. Um, a Fourier features approximation, and a random forest. And what we see is that sort of the exact GP and the sparse GP, if the sparse GP is sort of well set up, can naturally capture sort of the, uh, uh, the uncertainty of the model. And it sort of, it actually does what you would expect as you go further away from the data. However, the, uh, the random Fourier features approach, um, because it is using these sort of random features that interact in sort of strange ways, far away from the data, you can get strange oscillations in your uncertainty. And this can cause you to sort of get distracted by spurious features and can perhaps cause premature convergence, but can often just take away from the speed of the algorithm. And similarly, you can see these things happen with random forests if you get leaves of the forest that have few to no data in them. OK, another approach that is particularly interesting and is uh, starting to uh, get sort of more interest in both the Bayesian optimization community as well as sort of interactions with Bayesian optimization um, and uh, other type approaches are sort of replacing the uh, uh, replacing the Gaussian process with something like either a noisy neural network or some neural network based feature representation for some sort of a uh, Bayesian model. So in uh, 2015, uh, Jasper Snook and colleagues replaced the Gaussian process in uh, the sort of standard mechanism I've introduced earlier with the expected improvement metric, replace this with a Bayesian linear model with learned features. However, 
um, these features were learned uh, using a neural network trained on data. However, they really targeted this sort of high data regime, which could either be in the case, um, I believe they also did some relatively high dimensional uh, settings. But the main thing to point out here is that there was a lot of data. So I believe uh, the linear features here were also pre-trained, um, which, which actually uh, uh, raises some interesting connections between this talk and the previous talk. Um, and it was uh, also, uh, there were additional parameters that were then sampled around the Bayesian linear model, so as to not underestimate the uncertainty. This model still involves a matrix inverse, but it's of size D, which is the feature dimension, rather than N. So as N goes either, well, as it goes to infinity, but especially as it gets into uh, the uh, 10,000 to a million uh, uh, observation setting, doing something in D rather than N is vastly going to help you. However, one thing to point out is that uh, so they had this neural network representation for their features. They found that the sort of unbounded behavior of the, the ReLU that they were using uh, in uh, this setting can have a sort of drastic effect on the uncertainty estimates you get from the Bayesian linear model. In this case, they, you can either use all 10H units or you can use a combination of ReLU and 10H units only on the output layer. And that manages to do a much better job at uh, allowing you to estimate the uncertainty. Um, but just using ReLU units can perhaps uh, cause this, uh, this to sort of blow up and uh, slow down your optimization procedure. Um, and this, this is a, an effect that it also uh, uh, has, uh, has consequences when using a uh, Bayesian neural a noisy Bayesian uh, neural network. Yeah. Is it important to also get the N from N down to D by using like a star QP? Yeah. Uh, so one yeah. question would be how would you compare like why you might pull on the other? And then also sort of a follow on that question would be like, if you need to work on kind of yeah. more deep QPs where you're using a deep neural net to learn these additional QPs. There have been there has there has been some work in there. It's um, I, I would say one of the difficulties here is that uh, you, you sort of want to naturally transition between uh, low data regimes and high data regimes um, and uh, with, without necessarily knowing when you're going to make that transition. Um, and so that is something that is not necessarily a, a question that's unanswerable, but it just it, it hasn't had much eyes on it yet. Um, and yes, uh, you, you can definitely use uh, sparse Gaussian processes. I think it really comes down to what the sort of, of, of data you're working with is, what your functions end up looking like. If they're well modeled with a uh, Gaussian process, I would say that a, a sparse, Gauss, uh, sparse Gaussian process would potentially be the better solution there. However, with sparse Gaussian processes, you also have the issue of either optimizing the inducing points or placing your inducing points. Um, and in higher dimensional settings, uh, both of those problems can be difficult. So I, I, I know this is a bit of a cop out, but it, it depends on, on what the, the, the function you're optimizing looks like. So there is a so there is naturally if you if you assume sort of uh, a uh, Gaussian observation model there is a sort of natural regularization parameter and in practice people will tend to uh, uh, you know sort of fudge this factor a little bit higher uh, just to make sure that it is that it is uh, you know not close to singular or anything like that um, but. If you're in a set, so this actually becomes more difficult when you're optimizing functions which uh, are actually noiseless. If you're optimizing noisy functions, sort of paradoxically, fitting the Gaussian process is a lot simpler. And so worrying about uh, sort of adding a nugget parameter or something like that doesn't really matter. Yeah. OK. Um, so an, an, another sort of very interesting extension and one that is becoming more and more necessary 
um, is sort of uh, parallel Bayesian optimization. So in practice, we can often run many experiments or many queries in parallel. Um, but care must be taken not to query the same point m times. From an information theoretic perspective, uh, especially when you have some sort of regularity in your data. If you were just going to query the same point m different times, you're really wasting a lot of your capacity for gaining new information. Um, so really, this is, this is something that's uh, wasteful. So you could say, OK, we've got these nice acquisition functions. Let's do something like try and find the optimal set of m points that we could allocate um, in order to query this, uh, the, the, the function. However, actually performing this sort of optimal allocation is itself computationally intractable. Therefore, uh, recently, uh, a number of approaches have been taken. Um, I've highlighted a, a few of them there. Um, I think this one from, I think the second one there uh, from Desitals uh, et al. Is, is particularly interesting. Um, it analyzes sort of, it introduces and analyzes uh, a variant of GPUCB, which is able to do sort of batch parallel GPUCB. And in that setting, you essentially, the first iteration you can see as using your standard, let's say, uh, EI or UCB uh, acquisition function. And then the next set of queries in your, uh, uh, in your batch are some penalized version of your acquisition function, which often ends up looking like a penalty which penalizes the outstanding queries that you have in such a way that you reduce the variance at any points that you've considered but haven't yet gotten back information for. Now this is especially interesting because generally these papers are, are, are and, and this work is written in such a way that you're, you're sort of doing this in lockstep. You're, you're looking at different batches of the data. But you can easily consider uh, asynchronous evaluation of these acquisition functions. And so it's just any point that you've sent out to be queried, but you haven't heard back from yet. When you're considering the next point, that you, you uh, assume that the variance is going to be reduced for the points that you haven't heard back from yet. Um, and there are a number of sort of, again, these, uh, these methods here um, that I've described. And I will make these slides uh, available later so you can get all of the references um, that I've put up here. Um, so these provide another, uh, a, a number of mechanisms for doing this. Um, and in fact, I believe the uh, uh, Desitals work gives some, for those of you interested, some sort of analysis of the uh, uh, convergence behavior of this algorithm. OK, An another interesting approach is uh, adding additional unknown constraints to this procedure. So we've already talked about sort of the, the classical uh, box constraints that we generally use with Bayesian optimization. But it's also possible to say that as well, when I query the function f, I'm going to get back the value at f, but I'm also going to get back um, some black box estimate of whether some sort of constraint has been met. So this might be something like, I'm going to optimize the architecture of a neural network, and I might want the neural network to return results. I don't care if it's less than 200 milliseconds, but if it's greater than 200 milliseconds, then I just throw it away. Um, so that could be my constraint set. But there's a number of different uh, uh, sort of approaches. I'll highlight one in uh, sort of an application later where, this, where actually the constraints um, are sort of the interesting parts of the procedure. They're often the case where the function is relatively easy to evaluate, but it's the constraint that's much more difficult. So we can build a model both of the function and the constraint. Um, and this is some work from, uh, actually, originally it was done with uh, Schoenlau and Jones in 1998 um, for the expected improvement uh, acquisition function. So actually, I should point out that 
if there is anyone sort of interested in extending uh, the expected improvement acquisition function, you should probably go take a look at the uh, earlier works of Jones and Schoenlau because there's a good chance they already did it and just no one in machine learning has heard of it before. Um, so, but it was also extended by uh, Mike Gelbart and, uh, and uh, Hernandez Lobato for uh, a, another version of this with EI and the entropy search uh, approach. Entropy search and predictive entropy search are particularly interesting here because it allows points to be considered that gain information about a constraint, even though we might know that the function value is suboptimal. So we know that the function value is bad. We're never actually going to return the function value at some point x um, that we might query. But that point x might be able to give us additional information about whether what the constraint function looks like. And so we can easily trade off between these using this sort of uh, ES information-based procedure. Um, so there's a number of methods that I couldn't really get to. Um, I'm, I, I think I'm running a little bit low on time now. But there's a number of works on sort of learning model structure and learning additive structure for both Gaussian processes and other methods. Um, there's been some work recently on sort of trying to relieve myopia in Bayesian optimization. Although I, I would say this, uh, I would slightly quibble with the fact that sort of things like EI are, uh, uh, are myopic. They might be too myopic for uh, some, some sort of procedures. Um, but there's a number of inter really interesting work on that. There's also the knowledge gradient method, which I wasn't able to get into at all, which is um, it has some interesting properties and is quite closely related to the expected improvement and some more sort of advanced information-based methods. So I briefly wanted to talk about, uh, in the last couple minutes I have here, um, some interesting sort of applications of Bayesian optimization. Um, so most of this is, is not work that I, I, I've worked on at all. And I'll definitely point out the people um, who have uh, done some of this work. Um, so uh, in robotics, Bayesian optimization actually has a, uh, a very long history of, of use. Um, I think the first uses that I'm aware of it being used sort of in machine learning are from uh, Ruben martinez Cantin and uh, Dan Lazotte in about 2007, both of whom applied it to sort of uh, robot gate optimization and, um, and navigation with different robots. Um, of particular interesting uh, uh, use is this recent work of uh, Cully and others, um, which is w where, where the uh, figure on the right here comes from, which uh, basically it, uh, they construct a low dimensional sort of behavior space from a high dimensional parameter space that controls this sort of six legged robot. Um, and then uh, in order to uh, uh, learn behaviors with this robot, Bayesian optimization is applied within this behavior space. What's very interesting is that within this behavior space, um, they can then uh, sort of sadly break some of the legs of the little six-legged robot here um, and see that using Bayesian optimization, um, because of its sort of approach of using uncertainty, um, can quickly uh, adapt to this damaged behavior. And it can learn to continue walking even though it has one or more sort of broken limbs. It's, it, it's not as uh, restricted to only a single policy when you're able to learn in this way. Um, so there's also some work uh, from, so original work, um, and this is where the figure on the right uh, comes from, from uh, Gomez Bombarelli and, and others um, who introduced this, uh, uh, so this is actually not using Bayesian optimization, but they uh, introduced a VIE, which is able to uh, encode uh, molecule descriptions um, for some procedure. Now, what you end up with is a method that gives you a continuous latent space for molecules. So we have a continuous latent space. We have you know, continuous optimizers. This sounds like a match made in heaven. Um, so they can uh, optimize for particular uh, uh, sort of um, approaches to take, these mo for, take for these molecules um, and do this in the latent space. 
However, you can see here on the right with this approach, they used a very sort of local search type approach. They basically used a genetic algorithm for doing this. And one of the reasons they explain behind this is because that often you will have uh, sort of very local regions in this continuous, um, this continuous optimization space. And what you end up having is that something like Bayesian optimization is not able to work because it jumps around the space much too frequently. So in fact, one potential approach to fix this was introduced by uh, Griffiths and I believe Hernandez Lobato in uh, uh, 2017, which introduced a constrained expected improvement procedure where the constraints handle the validation process of these molecules. So you will, tr you will consider querying some molecules, and then you won't actually query it uh, in the real world because of the fact that um, it's, it's not actually a valid molecule that could be constructed. So then you go back to the uh, continuous space and continue optimizing there. OK. Um, this is some early, in fact, quite early work uh, uh, for uh, Bayesian optimization, um, which uh, this is by uh, Eric Brochu and others, which introduced a method for learning the parameters of a smoke simulator from human preferences. One of the interesting things about this particular model is that now, um, whereas before I talked pretty much about Gaussian processes with, uh, with um, Gaussian likelihoods. So the observation model that I have is a Gaussian. Here, the observation model is not a Gaussian in any way, shape, or form. The observation model is what we get to see is we provide a user with four potential uh, smoke simulations. Because uh, for even for expert users, uh, optimizing the parameters to uh, get sort of the smoke that you want to see is difficult. It involves, I believe in this case, a 29 per, uh, dimensional parameter space. So instead, what this procedure will do will use Bayesian optimization to select four different points and then provide those four different simulations to the user. And given these simulations, the user will say, well, I like the one in the upper right-hand corner the best. That's the one that I'm looking for, or that's more like what I'm looking for. So essentially what this will do is this will go back and forth with the user. It will interact and provide a number of different potential solutions to the problem. It's essentially modeling the preference behavior of the user using the Gaussian process using these sort of non-Gaussian likelihood models. So that's, that's a really interesting approach. Um, this, and I think this is my last one, but um, you can also do Bayesian optimization for Bayesian optimization. Um, so we did this a number of years ago where we tried to select between different acquisition strategies um, and we used a, actually a bandit procedure, but you could use a, a sort of a Bayesian bandit procedure as well to switch between these different acquisition strategies. And you see really interesting behavior where actually what happens is you're often able to do better than even the best underlying acquisition strategy because you'll have a number of strategies which are good early on in the process but are bad later on in the process of optimization. So you can switch naturally back and forth between them. Um, and you can see on, on the bottom, we have sort of some plots of what things were tried out and how that evolved over time. Um, ah, this is the last one. So the uh, last sort of application is sort of a, a cloud. It is the probably classical application of Bayesian optimization to hyperparameter tuning. Um, and there are too many papers to cite them all. So um, if, if you're interested, come talk to me. But one I would like to single out is, is some great new work from uh, Frank Hutter's group. This is Faulkner et al. From, uh, from just this year, just at ICML, which is really looking at very highly tuned Bayesian optimization algorithms um, for, uh, for hyperparameter optimization, sort of mixing this with some work from the bandits literature as well. Uh, it's also worth pointing out some things which sort of build interesting models 
of what's actually going on in the space of the functions we're optimizing. So some of this could take the form of learning what training curves look like and using these models of training curves to switch back and forth between different sort of models we might be interested in optimizing. Um, and similarly, uh, at a different level, uh, Roman Garnett um, and, and some others have been looking at very recently in sort of learning not only the, the sort of hyperparameters of, say, a Gaussian process, but even some of the model structure in either neural networks or uh, uh, sort of Gaussian process kernels for building up our sort of latent representation of what the function looks like. So I believe we, so I, I, I was hoping to get to this. I think we're uh, about out of time here. So I'm going to skip over this section. But definitely come talk to me later, and I can, I can give you some pointers to sort of the theoretical uh, underpinnings of some of these methods. So I'll skip to the end. There's only a few slides there, so I can even walk you through in person. But thank you um, for having me. And I can answer any questions if anyone still has them.